Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Stephen Samus, Vice President of Programs at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead, sir. Hello and welcome to this informational call for the Acute Care for Elders, or ACE Collaborative. ACE is a 12-month quality improvement collaborative that we're launching here at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, or CFHI, in partnership with Technology Evaluation and the Elderly Network, TVN. As you heard, my name is Stephen Samus. I'm Vice President of Programs here at CFHI, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's call. I noticed that a number of you have already started to introduce yourselves in the chat box, and I would encourage the rest of you to please introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, and so we have a sense of who's joining us today. Uh, I'll also take this moment to introduce our speakers. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. John Muscadere. He is Scientific Director and Chief Executive Officer at TVN. He is a Professor of Medicine at Queen's University School of Medicine and an intensivist at Kingston General Hospital in Kingston, Ontario. Welcome, John. And we also have Dr. Samir Sinha. He is a passionate and respected advocate for the needs of older adults and is Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai in Toronto and the University Health Network Hospitals. He is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He will be the lead faculty for the ACE Collaborative, which aims to spread the successes of Mount Sinai Hospital's ACE strategy more broadly across the country and perhaps abroad. Also joining us today is Claudia Marr. She's a Senior Improvement Lead here at CFHI, and she's the Foundation's Lead for the ACE Collaborative. John will start today's call by introducing TVN and how they're partnering with CFHI to support the Collaborative. We'll then hear from Samir, who will tell us about the Mount Sinai Hospital ACE strategy and its impressive results, followed by Claudia, who will introduce the ACE Collaborative delivery, format, content, and activities. We're going to wrap up today's call with a question and answer session that will focus on helping you assess your organization's readiness uh, to apply for this collaborative based on the enrollment criteria. First, a little bit about us. The Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement is dedicated to working with healthcare organizations to accelerate healthcare improvement for Canadians. We support the spread of healthcare innovations across Canada. And in 2014, we worked closely with healthcare providers, governments, policymakers, and other leaders to bring about real improvements in the quality and efficiency of patient care, the spread of innovations, and in healthcare delivery across the country. On this slide, you see a summary of some of the most common quality improvement collaborative or QIC components that were captured in a Millbank quarterly systematic review of improvement collaboratives done in 2013. It aligns well with how CFHI approaches the design and delivery of our QICs by promoting a focus on improving provider practices or patient outcomes, using structured activities for developmental team and cross-team learning, combining expert evidence in evidence-based medicine and quality improvement within an improvement model that prioritizes improvement and feedback, and also relying on multidisciplinary teams who are executing small tests of change. So that's basically how we work through this collaborative approach, and I'm now going to pass it over to John, who's going to share more information about TVN's work and its relationship to the collaborative. Over to you, John. Uh, to be here and uh, as an organization we're we're delighted to participate in in this uh, in the initiative I think that it's uh, it's it's a very uh, important one and certainly is in line with the goals of TVN I'm just going to spend a minute talking about uh, uh, TVN and who we are we're a national not-for-profit network we're funded by the National Centers of Excellence um, and we're funded to develop, evaluate, and disseminate knowledge on health care for frail elderly Canadians, their families, and caregivers. We're, uh, we're pan-Canadian, uh, and we sponsor multidisciplinary research with academic and non-academic non uh, partners. Uh, we were launched in uh, July of 2012, and we're hosted here at uh, Queen's University uh, and Kingston uh, General Hospital. Uh, our network is... Uh, 
Um, it goes across uh, the country. We have uh, 40 member institutions. We fund over 400 researchers. We have over 100 funded research projects, uh, 230 trainees, and 2,400 members. So we're fairly uh, wide. We've grown the network fairly extensive. And one of uh, the, our big focus, uh, foci is, um, is knowledge mobilization. And uh, we are focused on two things. One is to increase the knowledge of the impact and management of frailty. Uh, we advocate for screening for frailty in the Canadian healthcare systems, and in, and our research programs um, uh, look at uh, uh, improving the detection, prevention, and management uh, to reduce future hospitalization, improve outcomes, and to end vitality and quality of life for those who are frail. And uh, also, we have a strong knowledge mobil uh, mobilization focus on engaging the frail elderly and family caregivers. Um, and as part of our knowledge mobilization, we partner with industry, governments, NGOs, community groups, and other health networks to leverage our resources. And that's why I think this initiative is, is very important and, and us partnering uh, with us, CFHI will be, uh, will be a very uh, um, uh, nice opportunity uh, going forward. And uh, saying that, I'll turn it uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and turn it over uh, to back to Stephen. Great. Thanks so much, John. We're just delighted to have TVN as a partner in this. The fact that uh, you're a federally funded NCE, you really focused on engaging families and caregivers on implementation, on partnerships and networks. It is a terrific uh, complement to the work that we do here at CFHI. Uh, it's my pleasure now to turn things over to Samir. Uh, to share more about Mount Sinai and specifically the ACE strategy. Samir. Thank you very much, Stephen, and, um, and welcome everyone as well today. So I'm happy to be here representing a dynamic team from Sinai um, just to talk a little bit about the need and a little bit about what we've done here and, and what we hope to share with many of you in the collaborative. So you can see on the first slide here, just we everybody here knows that we have an aging population and these are just some of the stats that remind us that older Canadians represent a small proportion of our population, yet they account for um, a significant number of acute care hospitalizations and the majority of hospital bed days uh, in our country. We also know the demographic imperative has our older population doubling in the next 20 uh, years and the 85 and older population being set to quadruple. So obviously we can see a lot of challenges with this, uh, but we also see an incredible amount of opportunity. On the next slide here, and I apologize for the small writing, um, but uh, the geriatrics at Mount Sinai were, were as officially as an organization, were located in downtown Toronto as part of, a, of now what we call the Sinai Health System. So we have a few different organizations involved, but principally for Mount Sinai Hospital, we're a 472-bed hospital, um, and we're in a growing uh, and busy part of Toronto. Um, so what we're actually seeing is our merge volumes of, of our hospital have actually doubled over the last 10 years, uh, and uh, we have significant number of people being admitted um, to our medical services who are 65 and above. And in fact, over the last few years, we've actually seen um, a 53% increase in the last five years of people 65 and older being admitted to our general medical services, not because we're trying to admit more people, but just the pressure on our downtown hospitals is significant. So the hospital took a leadership role back in 2010 by, uh, by making geriatrics a core strategic priority. And really we started operationalizing that as a team by really thinking about our ACE strategy or our acute care for elders strategy that really looked at developing a comprehensive and integrated approach um, that really focused on interprofessional teams in a variety of settings. And really when we started thinking about where our teams could be effective, it was kind of really everywhere across the continuum. So really focusing on uh, partnering with our community partners uh, and interprofessional teams in that environment, thinking about that in the emergency department, thinking about that on our acute care wards, for example, and really making sure that we have a good focus um, with primary and community care sectors as well. 
Uh, we've received a number of accolades uh, because of this, and we have really used um, uh, our relationship with Niche, or Nurses for Improving the Care of Health System Elders, uh, to really advance a lot of our work. Um, and recently, uh, we became the first hospital in Canada to achieve the magnet designation uh, for excellence in nursing uh, as well. Three of our geriatric care models that we'll be talking about have also been designated now as leading practices by Accreditation Canada. So we're quite proud of what we've developed over time. When we think about our ACE strategy and our principles on slide 13, we really focus on four key ideas. One is that we don't want to say that hospitals are terrible places for older people, therefore we shouldn't have hospitals. Uh, we really focus on saying, how do we actually take the care that people will need in hospital and make it more elder friendly? How do we start utilizing our community or our transitional care services in different ways um, and redesigning them um, in a sustainable way to enhance and improve upon current service models? This, of course, requires a shift in traditional thinking, mainly because many of our organizations were developed and developed their services 50 years ago, if you will, on the overall model of acute care um, that was based at a time when the average Canadian was 27 years of age. Um, and we didn't have a lot of the patients presenting to our organizations today that we did 50 years ago. So we really focus as well on making sure that we're identifying those older patients who are at risk and then trying to mitigate that risk by intervening early to maintain independence. So it's recognizing that there's a great level of heterogeneity amongst our older population. Not every older adult is frail. Um, only a small proportion are frail overall. Yet those are the individuals that we most often see in our hospitals um, and those are the ones that need a more tailored approach to care. And of course the fourth principle of our around our ACE strategy is really focusing on uh, monitoring and evaluating everything we do to really support continuous quality improvement. So we really build on the elder-friendly hospital model. This is a concept developed by Belinda Park out of the University of Alberta, and it really talks about four concepts that come together uh, to minimize functional decline, promote safety, and mitigate adverse social and medical outcomes. And you can see, and again, there are different versions of this model out there, but the idea is we really focus on four overall concepts. One is the culture of the organization. Are we thinking about um, older adults? Uh, as being key members of our hospital community and then therefore how do we tailor the training that we give our staff, how do we make sure that our organization is receptive to the needs of older adults and takes their needs into account as well. Not just in the clinical care we provide but even the way we communicate with our public um, and, uh, and the way we provide services um, overall. Uh, policies and procedures really think about are we making sure that what we're doing also has an elder-friendly lens to it as well. So are we making sure that we don't have any policies or practices that may actually hinder um, the support or the needs of, of older individuals in particular, whether they be patients or other members of our community in one way or the other. Care systems, processes, and services is going to be a core aspect of our collaborative work. And this really talks about the individual models of care or care practices that we have uh, implemented here. And we looked forward to working with hospitals in the collaborative um, and other partners to help them implement uh, similar things as well. And then finally, the other piece, though an important piece but not a uh, not the most important piece, is that of physical design. And we mean that by sometimes people say that, oh, well, if you just design a, a brand new unit that's all designed to elder-friendly principles, then the care will significantly improve. Now, physical design can certainly help improve the care of older adults, but really we often believe at our hospital that it's really getting, making sure that we have well-educated staff who are supported and engaged in caring for older adults is the secret sauce and the physical design elements certainly help make sure um, that we can do uh, better overall. So this is just a snapshot of, of the different models and care practices um, that we've developed over time. Some of these principles were in place before 2010 when our hospital made um, our geriatrics programs a, a more of a strategic focus. Um, the dark blue that you see are things that we've actually created and implemented over the last five years. Um, and, then, um, and then the light blue items are things that we're just developing over this fiscal year as well. So definitely a lot 
lot of programs that we're focused on um, either developing, leading, or participating in at the community level, in the emergency department level, the inpatient level, and the ambulatory setting, but all linked together to really work as a continuum of care to better support older patients um, in our hospital but in our community as well. The next uh, slide on 16 here talks about the ACE strategy components that we're really going to be focusing on um, in this collaborative uh, in particular. And it really just focuses if we could group them into emergency department components, inpatient care components, and transitional and community-based care um, uh, components as well. And again, a lot of these things will be very familiar to people. It's not that we are the only ones who have developed ACE units, for example, or have established what we call geriatric emergency management nursing models. Um, again, many of these things may resonate with people on the call um, who are saying, well, we've actually implemented, you know, item number six and we've actually done 18. Our goal is showing kind of all the different things that we've actually implemented and therefore if your organization sees an opportunity to say, wow, we'd love some real help um, implementing um, an ACE unit, for example, you know, maybe this, then this collaborative is something that can help us um, develop that next model um, that we may have been struggling or we may have been thinking about, but um, this is a great opportunity to do so. So this really focuses on those different components uh, in particular. Um, in terms of how effective has our strategy been, we're really proud to say that developing a, a collaborative approach to care has really shown a significant payoff in terms of overall results. On this slide, you'll actually see the data related to our medical admissions to the hospital. Um, as you can see, just the number of visits to the emergency department on the first line has increased in the first four years of, of our strategy by about 26%. Um, we're just getting our, our latest year's data finalized, but the numbers continue to climb uh, in particular. We've seen an increase in our medical admissions and certainly an increase in the complexity of the patients that we're actually seeing as well. But the key story was by actually actually delivering more elder-friendly care by utilizing all those new care systems and processes and models with the same existing staff, if you will, we were able to actually decreasing our, decrease our length of stay by 28% um, and we're able to get more patients directly back home um, than to other locations like nursing, home or nursing homes or rehab centers, for example. And we're able to also see a decrease in our ALC days by about 20%. And actually, we managed to close um, beds during this whole transition, uh, even though we were seeing more patients overall, mainly because we felt that we were able to do this care more efficiently um, and therefore could allow us to actually close beds as well. The next slide actually shows some of the balancing metrics that our team uses as well because one could say, well, if you're getting patients out sooner, are they being readmitted more quickly? And you'll see that's really not the case. And part of the way we think that we're getting patients more likely getting patients home and back to the community is we've been able to really influence certain care um, aspects. Uh, for example, by mobilizing patients um, as a significant part of our, our work that we do on the wards, for example, we've seen a significant decrease increase in pressure ulcer incidents at our hospital. We've also really focused quite a lot of attention on decreasing the unnecessary utilization of urinary catheters. And so we've seen a significant drop in our catheter utilization rates. Um, and our patient satisfaction, I think, because patients are less tethered, um, having less complications and more likely going home, is perhaps why our, our patient satisfaction rate uh, continues to climb. And by doing uh, cost um, costs and economic calculations here, we've actually generated about $6.7 million in cost avoidance alone um, compared to 2009-10 uh, based on the work that we've actually been doing. Um, we have another model that, we do, that, that, that we've been doing is called our GEM Nursing Initiative in the Emergency Department. And you'll see here from this slide here um, that we really by focusing uh, in this model that uh, was staffed in 2014 with two and a half nurses uh, working over the course of uh, 2.5 FTE nurses who are working over the course of a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday, and then about eight-hour shifts on the weekend, what we're able to see was that over the course of one 
one year, they were able to see just over a thousand patients. And through the work that they were doing, they were able to generate a lower admission rate for the patients they were seeing that tended to be a bit more sicker um, and more challenged than, say, the non-GEM patients they were seeing, as evidenced by the higher rate of um, ambulance arrivals and some other factors that we looked at that aren't on this slide. But the key was that they achieved a lower admission rate compared to the patients they weren't seeing, who may even have been a little less acute. Um, and this translates into fewer admissions um, and avoided bed days, which again translates into potential savings for the hospital as well. Finally, um, another slide really talks about our orthogeriatrics model, for example. Again, we're in a busy um, and growing part of downtown Toronto, so our volumes continue to increase um, overall in terms of emergency department visits. And you'll see that our hip fracture admissions, um, again, if you have a hip fracture and you come to, your ho to our hospital, we have to admit you and we're going to obviously offer uh, patient surgery if it's appropriate. But overall, by delivering more efficient care um, in a collaborative geriatric and orthopedic model, uh, what we've been able to do is significantly decrease length of stays, um, decrease our ALC days per patient, and again generate um, a significant level of savings uh, with only a, less than 200 patients in the last year um, that we had data for this as well. So that's basically uh, what we've been up to, um, and uh, we're really proud about what we've been doing. But the key messages are, this is really a team-based approach to care. This has been a great partnership um, with my colleague Jocelyn Bennett, um, who is really helping to lead a lot of the administrative uh, work at our hospital over the last number of years, um, and also a group of clinicians, not just doctors, but nurses, social workers, therapists, really helping to lead that care. So I'll stop there and, and pass it over to the next presenter. Great. Thank you so much, Samir, for that excellent overview of the ACE strategy. And, you know, the data that you present really do uh, show, demonstrate that this is an excellent example of better care, better health, and better value. Um, so we're very excited to be partnering with you and with TVN on the uh, spread of this wonderful work across the country. Before I turn it over to Claudia, who's going to really introduce the ACE Collaborative and its structure, we're, cur we're going to throw up a little poll. We're curious to know um, your answers to a couple of questions. The first one is, how is your organization doing in terms of implementing elder-friendly models of care and processes? Which phrase best describes where your organization is at? Um, a, we are currently implementing elder-friendly models of care and care practices. B, we're thinking about implementing elder-friendly models of care and care practices. Or C, we're not yet implementing elder-friendly models of care and care practices. And then the second question, so we'll give you a moment to respond to that. Um, and then the second part of this would be, what questions can we address for you today that will help your organization or practice decide if this collaborative is a good fit? So we'll just take a few moments here while you can respond to those two questions. So very interesting. So a number of you are already implementing elder-friendly uh, models of care and care practices. Perhaps in the box uh, below, uh, you could give us a sense of some elements of that Samir identified that you would find helpful to work on in future. Uh, maybe give us a sense of those things that you already are working on and some of those things that you would be interested in working on.
Well, thank you so much. It's very interesting to see uh, both the data at the top and some of the questions below. And I noticed that some of the questions below, we will uh, get to your questions in due course, but I noticed that the nature of many of the questions really is around the collaborative and how it's going to work and what we're going to try to do. So with that, I think it's a great time to turn it over to Claudia. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. And to, and to Samir for providing that great overview of the strategy. So this concept that you see on the slide uh, really underpin, that underpins the, the A strategy initiative is really a question of how we can best close the really obvious gaps in care that Samir and others have described in terms of what patients and families need and what they traditionally receive from our healthcare systems to make the best practice the common practice. And to do that, we, our, our aim is really to shift from episodic care traditionally delivered in our hospitals to care that's truly patient-centered and promotes patients' return home, as well as maintains their functional ability and independence for as long as possible. So to do so requires a certain shift from our traditional thinking that's quite pervasive in our healthcare system, and that's the dominant approach, to one that really promotes the emerging direction. So this is a slide I, I borrowed from one of Helen Bevan's presentations. She's the chief of service transfer, she's chief, chief of service transformation at the NHS and really a champion of transformational change in our healthcare system. And this slide highlights the, some of the elements that we need to overcome to make that shift that involves moving from focus from the focus of a hospital or organizational mentality to one that really optimizes on the community and home care uh, components. We also need to move from a power of, of hierarchy to really emotional connections developed through a shared purpose and understanding of what needs to be changed in our organizations and practice. Similarly, we need to move beyond strictly leadership-driven innovation to viral creativity that leverages the clinical and administrative front lines. Together, that can help us move from the tried and tested experience-based innovation to co-created changes. And what that boils down to is really moving from transactions of care to relationships with patients and families as well as providers working in our healthcare system. So what does success look like for teams in terms of what we hope they'll gain through this 12-month collaborative? And as we see in the, in, in the live polling and in the chat box, um, a lot of you have, have many elder-friendly models of care and practices already in place within your organizations. So our role will really be to support you in leveraging that experience and developing expertise as it relates to adapting and implementing additional A strategy interventions to your local context. So ultimately, that's about helping you to improve patient experience and satisfaction, and that should be our number one priority. It's also about improving the staff experience and satisfaction. It's about providing more coordinated care across the care continuum and really leveraging the hospital to home and community care aspects of this strategy as well as, as partnerships that can develop. And it's also about improving the system outcomes that, that um, result as, a, as, a, as a, a result of these initi initiatives. So that's really about removing, reducing the number of overall emergency department visits, the hospitalizations, as well as the patient complications. So here's some of the core elements of the collaborative, and it's a 12-month initiative that starts next March until March of 2017. Up to, six, uh, up to 15 successful teams are going to be accepted into the collaborative, and they'll receive a seed funding of up to $40,000 each for the, the direct costs associated to adapting and implementing the ACE strategy intervention. It's a largely virtually delivered program, which is going to focus on providing teams with education and training in both evidence-based medicine as well as quality improvement through webinars that are quite a, a similar technology to what's being offered today with our, our teleconference and, our, and the visual that you see. And we'll have some specific calls for team leads as well as those working on measurement and so on. So we do expect that some of that workload is going to be distributed amongst the team. And a portion of the calls are also going to be dedicated to cross-site learning about your initiatives and in progress. There will be an online learning platform, which is really um, a, a platform that will store on-demand recordings of webinars on, as well as the PowerPoints that we use throughout the collaborative, the worksheets, resources, as well as each other's information. We'll be offering some coaching calls with individual teams on a regular basis. Some of those will be scheduled in advance, and some of those will be initiated based on your own need. Um, there will be th about three sets of team progress updates throughout the year, and those will provide an opportunity to share the latest successes, challenges, and milestones amongst teams, and also to, re to receive some of the live feedback from faculty and staff participating on the calls. 
We expect to have one face-to-face -face workshop in the fall of 2016 based on where we see teams coming together from across the country and even potentially internationally. And there is this idea of a, of a, a, that we're launching a policy leadership working group, which is con the role of which is going to be to consider the necessary management, governance, financing, and policy factors to really support the readiness, implementation, sustainability, as well as scale-up of elder-friendly practices, both within organizations and regions. So in terms of key upcoming dates, we have February 1st, 2016, which is our deadline for submitting an application form, and that's available through our website as of this morning. And we've also included the link on one of our later slides. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be limiting enrollment to 15 teams, so please be sure to submit your application before the deadline. We've intentionally held three dates, so February 19th, 22nd, and 24th as dates to conduct what we call readiness interviews. And those will be an opportunity for CFHI staff and faculty to seek clarification on your application and to gain additional details that might help us reach a decision about your overall readiness to participate in the collaborative. It's also an opportunity for you to ask some questions about your own application and the Memorandum of Understanding, or the MOU. And that's essentially a document that outlines CFHI support, as well as the team's commitment to fully participate in the collaborative. We'll plan to notify the teams of their results by February 26, and those who are successful should be in a position then to start initiating and signing the MOU by March 11th. And those details and more are all included in the, in the prospectus and the expression of commitment or the application form that are available on our website. So this is a rough visual of what, of what lies ahead for the 12-month collaborative. So generally, we see this, this initiative focusing on four main areas of activity which we've categorized here. So it really brings together the evidence-based practices or, or focusing on what the effective suites of services to be offering are, as well as the quality improvement side of things. So how can we best optimize the delivery um, of services that we deliver? So we'll start with the evidence-based or practice perspective by, by supporting teams and helping to assess their baseline information, understand the scope and breadth of the problems that we're each facing, and defining the patient population that we serve as well as their needs. Um, so really talking to, to the patients directly, involving them in the outset, as well as examining the current care pathways and your service offerings. Um, and connecting with the providers and stakeholders who are involved and really working together to start developing and designing those A strategy interventions to local context. We'll then move into implementation and change management side of things and, and really start to analyze our outcomes data. So together we'll tackle some of those implementation barriers, we'll troubleshoot some of the change management that takes place and start to rely on the assets and facilitators that we each have within our organizations and communities. By doing so, we'll be able to review our measures and set concrete and practical improvement targets. So it's only really once you're in that improvement cycle that you can start to talk about uh, concrete improvement targets, such as what, by what percent would you like to reduce emergency visits for your patient population or the use of urinary catheters and other such outcomes. So our focus then will be to shift towards improving performance. And finally, we'll spend some time considering the high-value practices, so some of the, what are the things that you're doing in your clinical practice and administrative work that bring value to your patients and families. And we'll also start to function as a learning collaborative, learning from both what each other is doing and also sharing best practice. So who should be applying to this collaborative? So these should be healthcare delivery organizations, primarily hospitals, um, given the nature of the work. And these are hospitals who have initiated their journey towards becoming elder-friendly and who could also reach beyond their usual boundaries to develop some cross-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, and, and or interprofessional partnerships that range from the acute to community and home care uh, settings. So that means that you've implemented two or more of the A strategy components that Samir described earlier and that you'd be in a position to implement at least one additional component as part of this collaborative. So we're also looking for organizations who would be in a position to implement a balanced scorecard that's a combination of common measures being tracked across teams, but it also has been tailored to your context to effectively track performance on a number of indicators at the patient family level as well as the provider and system levels. We also see participating organizations as being capable of carrying out the dissemination of results within their organizations and regions. 
And so in some ways, becoming champions of elder-friendly care within your respective settings. In terms of team composition, there should be a minimum of five key functions. So that said, the same person can occupy multiple roles, although we do caution that, and I'll get, I'll get back to that in a, in a minute. So first, there should be an incredibly dedicated team lead, and that person is really going to be the key coordinator and motivator. They're going to ensure that the milestones are met, and they'll serve as the main point of contact for CFHI. The individual is primarily going to be accountable for the design, implementation, and evaluation of the initiative, so this really can't be an off-the-side-of-the-desk type of, of function on the team. In parallel, the team lead is going to work pretty closely with a measurement lead who will be accountable for the evaluation of the innovation. So their role is going to be to support and coordinate data analysis. They're going to regularly communicate results to various stakeholders. And they're also going to participate in all of the activities related to measurement during the collaborative. Uh, and in previous CFHI collaboratives, the team lead has also been the measurement lead for certain sites. And we don't recommend that as those are two of the most demanding functions on the team. There should also be at least one physician champion, and their role is going to really be to work with the team lead and provide necessary clinical support to staff. Depending on the available resources within your organization, that physician can be ideally a geriatrician, but it could also be a primary care physician or, or even a palliative care physician, depending on your available resource base. Similarly, there should be at least one nursing champion. And we do uh, reiterate that it's at least one nursing champion, so there can be more as part of your team, as you'll notice that there's a, quite a strong emphasis on nursing in the A strategy. So that can be a registered nurse or an advanced practice nurse with the, the required expertise, but it could also be a nursing administrator. We're also interested to work with teams who have a patient, family, caregiver, advisor, and we see these individuals as having experience and expertise as service users within your healthcare organizations and who could really advise the team on patient-centered approaches to care as you start to design, implement, evaluate, and spread your initiatives. So that said, those are the formal roles as part of the team, um, but there should be explicit support and engagement from the CEO or highest level of leadership within your organization, as well as a member of senior management, and that could include a clinical or administrative lead um, that would help support the, the oversight, the, manage the oversight of the initiative and provide the, and ensure that there are dedicated time and resources allocated to this type of, of work. So as you complete your application form, uh, try to describe your context in a way that really helps paint the picture and helps us under, to understand who is going to constitute the team within your organization and the, some of the rationale as to why these individuals have been identified and selected. Uh, and perhaps I'll just end on the note around uh, faculty. So in, 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 terms, in order to better support you throughout the next 12 months, our faculty and staff are going to bring together uh, a large range of expertise in both evidence-based medicine, so particularly elder care and geriatrics, as well as quality improvement and policy. So we're quite looking forward to introducing you to them in time. And do keep in mind that this is, it plans to be a very participatory type of collaborative where as we're going through each of the learning sessions and webinars, we'll be calling upon teams to share their work and their metrics and the ways in which they're bringing improvements to the organization. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Great. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, we do now have some time to take questions from, from those of you online. We please ask you to please submit your questions using the chat box on the bottom of your screen. And there are already a couple up here, and so we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, address those. Um, the first one from Scott, how has, the A how has ACE been leveraged with other regional and provincial QI initiatives? So, for example, with Health Links in Ontario and ICC, or with bundled, fund, bundled funding models, maybe QBPs. Samir, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, happy to uh, say a little bit of that. I think you know one of the key things that we've really tried to do as an organization is to be engaged with our local health link, um, and also keep abreast on the different kind of provincial um, uh, and the Lynn organized uh, uh, changes that are occurring in Ontario. So this is a very Ontario specific question, but um, with uh, with new models of care, funding for bundled care interventions, the assess and restore initiatives, some of these um, ministerial and and local 
local regional uh, initiatives. We've really uh, been involved actively in every one of those and been approved for funding, including the community paramedicine initiative as well. So I, I think the message here for you know our Ontario colleagues, but also for our colleagues around uh, around the um, around the country, is we've really tried to view our team not in isolation, but realizing that sometimes the way our hospital can grow um, our partnerships and strengthen those is if we work in partnership with our community partners to leverage whatever funding, whether it be research or whether it be, um, or whether it be programmatic funding that can help us uh, um, implement uh, models of care um, or practices that would be of interest. Thank you, Samir. Um, a, a kind of a related question uh, from Ruth Ellen at the Ottawa Hospital. I'm starting a PATH model of care clinic, consult service, which is palliative and therapeutic harmonization in Ottawa. Um, is this something that fits with the initiative? Is this something that you would see as fitting in with an ACE strategy? Again, Samir, if you could answer that one, please. Sure. Um, in fact, our group is well aware of, of the PATH initiative uh, in um, uh, based out of Halifax. This is, again, the palliative and therapeutic uh, harmonization model of care, which is kind of um, geriatrics, disposition planning, goals of care. It, it's, a really, it's, a, it's a really, really incredible model um, that's been developed there. Now, we haven't mentioned it formally as a part of our ACE collaborative because it's not a model that we have yet implemented, if you will, um, at Mount Sinai. Yet, you know, I think, you know, if there, if this is the model that people want to implement, for example, um, at uh, at their locations, then we certainly can think about how we could best support organizations to do that. Especially if we bring, again, as we start thinking about our faculty and what the different um, partners in this model want to do, we may be able to support that as a model to develop. I think, really, I think, as talking to Claudia and Stephen and the team at CFHI. You know, Mount Sinai has implemented a lot of the models that are out there, but not all of them. Um, and really, the collaborative is, it's a learning collaborative where we hope to learn from other folks as well. Um, but I think, you know, the key is, as people are thinking about their applications, tell us about what you want to do and implement, um, even if it's not necessarily on the list, because we may be able to still, you know, bring those groups into the into the collaborative um, if it makes sense and they and they fit the other criteria, and we feel that we can support um, um, the 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 knowledge and 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 the um, and the coaching required. I you know I may have spoken on behalf of CAFHI and TVN there, but I think Claudia is that in line with what we've talked about as well in the past. Absolutely. So if there's some form of alignment with what we're trying to achieve, um, and we've listed the 18 interventions because those are best practices and they they really span the continuum of care, but we're certainly going to be looking forward to see some of the adaptations that organizations have, have implemented um, as we submit their express commitment. I think it's also fair to say that in our other spread collaboratives that we've done today here at FHI, there is always this bi-directional learning. I mean, people are learning about uh, best practice uh, from, from Mount Sinai in this case, but there are things going on out there in the world that we are all learning from as we learn together. It's very much a collective learning environment. And we understand that there are um, uh, elements that are maybe not in place in Mount Sinai that are in place somewhere else, and we all gain that knowledge through participating together. I, there's been a few questions about the extent to which people will be getting more information. Just to let you know that the slide decks and the full recording of today, the prospectus will be sent to all of you, all of those of you who are registered for today's call, so you will be getting the information we're seeing today. We have a question also from Donna who says, um, what are the hours of availability of the GEM nurses? So that's very specific, Samir. So across the um, across the um, you know throughout Ontario and 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 other uh, provinces where they're implementing gem nursing models, it varies significantly. You know from place to place. Some hospitals may have a part time uh, person in that role. Others may have a full time single person in that role. We've really seen the value of the gem nursing model here. And so in addition to some of the regional funding we get, um, our hospital and the ED doctors themselves have topped up the funding um, so that we have two. So that last year we had two and a half 
uh, full-time equivalent nurses doing that role. The, in terms of the hours, um, really, I mean, my colleague Jocelyn really helped do a lot of the work on this in terms of looking at the flow um, and the timing that patients come through. And so on a, um, on a, on a given day, well, we have uh, nurses, uh, one nurse who starts at 8 a.m. and another who starts later on in the day. But essentially, we have some overlap between the two of them, but coverage from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday to Friday. And then we have less than that level of coverage with one nurse uh, on the weekend uh, for about eight hours each day uh, on the weekend. But that's how we've created it. But again, our advice and our lessons learned are take a look at when your patients are arriving um, and when a model like this could have the most effective impact as well. I can tell you that our ED docs are already saying, why couldn't we have gem nurses here 24 hours a day? So um, that's a nice problem to have. Thank you. And we already are seeing there from some other uh, participants on the call, Victoria at Island Health, uh, about when their gem nurses are on staff, et cetera. So that's great. And as well as the um, opportunity to integrate this into other work like PATH. So that's excellent. We did have another question um, about, um, uh, I'm trying to find it in here. I think you have to go further up. No, I think we might, uh, um, might be good. No, I think we might be good. Oh, yes, okay. That's it. What did you implement? So, Samir, this is really looking at the whole issue of the coordination of care and the, the, the you know, really understanding and doing well the transitions in care. And this is a um, question from Veni, which is, what did you implement within ACE to better integrate with the patient's GP and the home care team. So really, if you could speak a little bit more about that coordination of care, both with the primary care provider and the uh, home care providers. So great question, and I think, again, one of the philosophies that we really want to do is make sure that we try and be as seamless as possible, even though we are so siloed with the care that we provide. Um, so one of the things we've done is with our local home care agency, for example, um, we have coordinators who are based in our hospital. We have coordinator who, a coordinator who's based in our emergency department. Uh, and then we have coordinators who are, are working with our community teams, for example. And these are home care coordinators. But for example, for our inpatient geriatric rounds, you know, for our consultative service, um, we actually have a, the home, a home care coordinator who comes, you know, to join our geriatric rounds on a, on, a, on a weekly basis and is also kind of the lead coordinator who helps to work with our most complex patients um, that we collectively identify between the hospital and the local home care uh, authority as well. So we've tried to build models where we can actually um, physically actually get people meeting each other face to face so that people know each other's names, they know each other's numbers, so um, so that we can actually have more face-to-face -face and, and telephone communication. We've also developed some simple um, models of communication, like email notification systems, for example, so that for patients in our, our home-based primary care program called House Calls, uh, what we've done is all of those patients, and there's about five to 600 of them a year in the program, um, if any of those patients ever become ill, we preferentially um, um, they preferentially come to Mount Sinai Hospital because they know their home and community care and primary care is integrated with our hospital setting. That means that if the person comes either planned or unplanned, um, uh, what happens is when they register at the hospital emergency department, there's an email notification that goes out to about 25 different people, both inpatient providers, but also those community care coordinators, um, and also their primary care providers in that model. So we can literally have a virtual case conference uh, via secure email between all these different sectors that can sometimes relay really important information very quickly. We've also tried to adapt some, some some basic principles in our models so that if any of us ever come across a patient who doesn't have a primary care provider, one of the things we try and do besides treating the pneumonia is make sure that we find the person a primary care provider. So I do that quite a bit through my clinic. Our GEM nurses do that for their patients in the emergency department, and we do that as part of our discharge planning and disposition planning for patients leaving the inpatient ward um, as well. So we really try and um, do a lot of work, and those are maybe just a few examples of how we're trying to really improve communication between our primary care home and community care, but also our acute care providers as well. 
Great. Now, this, this question is really related to that, Samir. It's from Victoria at Island Health. Do you have a way to receive the patient care plans along with their own goals from the GPs or the NPs in the community care, uh, in the community, sorry, once the people are admitted? So um, again, another really good question is that um, what we, you know, we're more integrated with some primary care providers than others um, because I think similar to other parts of Canada, um, we have uh, sometimes we have challenges where people are solo practitioners or they may be uh, and they may not have electronic health records. Um, sometimes people are part of groups, for example, um, and then uh, and then we have more integrated teams like our house calls team, which is a group of four primary care providers um, who work very very closely with our group as well um, in that way. So what we what we what we have tried to do is when patients, especially those um, for those coming through our outpatient services or for us doing community or collaborative consults, for example, generally those those referrals come from the primary care providers, or even in cases where, for example, um, maybe the referral comes from a specialist, we make a, a point, you know, as part of our clinic and ambulatory and community practices, to a identify who the primary care provider is and ask them to send us. Um, specific information to round out the questions and make sure that we invite them for their input, including our telemedicine clinics and some of the other initiatives that way. For patients who come into the emergency department, um, we really try and encourage primary care providers to engage with our emergency clinicians. Um, so it's known you know, here in Toronto that if a primary care clinician calls the emergency department, they can literally talk to the ED doc within a few minutes uh, because we really the ED docs really value that information information, but it also just improves overall patient care. But we certainly try and again, um, from our inpatient models as well, um, if we need more information or things aren't 100% clear, we're often then, again, identifying the primary care provider, asking them to submit certain information. And we, and while you know, some people feel that it's a little bit of extra work. We found that it can actually be hugely helpful um, in terms of getting better context, but also making sure that we have a better transitional care plan because the primary care providers say, I didn't even know my patient was in the hospital. Thanks for letting me know, and thanks for letting me know what I need to do um, to support that transition. Great. Thank you, Samir. That's excellent. We're going to go back up and just take a quick look at the poll questions just to make sure that we addressed everything uh, from the poll questions. Uh, we will, uh, in a second, talk about how the funds, how you can use the funds. Um, I, Samir, could you speak a little bit about um, this whole issue of phys physician involvement in, in the work? And the question specifically was what support is available to, in particular, to assist physician involvement in the collaborative. Um, but, um, you know, could you just speak to that a little bit about the, what you've seen in Mount Sinai from, in terms of the physician involvement in the ACE strategy? Yeah, I think this is a. I mean, it's a common issue in terms of. I think you know what we were very clear for as a as a you know in partnership with CFHI was trying to think about you know really clinician involvement and clinician leadership here um, because you know we've we've certainly you know when we've hosted and we've hosted a number of hospitals across the country and internationally now who've wanted to uh, you know look at our models and maybe think about recreating and in some cases you have an enthusiastic group of administrators who are here and they get it and they want to do this and they even have fun and so on, but they don't actually have clinicians who are willing to champion and move this, this work forward. In other cases, and I think some of the comments I saw were um, that if you don't have leadership support, you know, that you don't have the hospital leadership, you know, the CEO, the board, and the senior leadership team, you know, supporting, you know, clinicians who want to be engaged, that can be a challenge. So you need both uh, levels of, of support, for example. Um, and, you know, it may be, I think, you know, from experience, I think it's less hard to get nurses excited and interested um, and other, uh, and then, and then other out health or, or, or other providers, for example, um, sometimes, you know, the, the one piece is because so much of the work in a hospital might be um, directed, if you will, you know, the physicians will be the ones who decide who gets be, to be admitted to the hospital, um, that if you don't actually have a physician helping to champion and uh, change behaviors of their colleagues or, or champion those initiatives, then that can sometimes be the rate limiting step, especially when we have a shortage of geriatricians and so on. I think the key is there are different ways in which we can engage physicians, for example. Sometimes it's important to see, you know, A, um, 
Is there someone sympathetic to the ideas and the cause, and then what do they need? It may mean they need some protected time, and that might simply be that instead of doing 38 different tasks, they're going to have some of their tasks adopted by their other colleagues so they can dedicate the time to this. It may be that they need some, some administrative support through a project manager. Um, I was certainly, you know, the secret sauce for me, for example, was I had a senior um, nursing leader at the organization um, who would help kind of do the administrative stuff stuff like budgets and um, and those strategic conversations that were kind of beyond my, my, my primary scope of expertise. Um, and again, that really helped me work well as part of a team uh, to move that forward. So, so I think, you know, every situation is different. And I don't think it's just about physician, although physician involvement is sometimes one of the more challenging clinical uh, roles to actually engage. But I think my, my answer is always there's sometimes a whole bunch of different factors, and it's understanding what's the story um, within your organization, and then how do we actually address those barriers accordingly. And that may be through financial support, um, but usually it's more about having more protected time um, and, uh, and maybe some administrative support as well. Great. Thank you, Samir. Um, John, there's a couple of quite related questions here. Um, one is around the whole issue of leadership buy-in and how you, you know, the, how you best um, get that leadership buy-in for this kind of work. The other question is a little more specific around how do you shift resources from a traditional care model to more of a geriatric-led model with that requisite leadership support? From your experience, John, could you just comment on that? Well, I, I think organizations, especially to address the the growing um, the growing uh, problem with uh, um, with with uh, um, in, uh, with the increasing number of uh, seniors and elderly, particularly the frail elderly um, in in hospitals, and and basically the way to engage that is that the organization, if it addresses this population well will actually function a lot better at the end of the day because um, these are the type of patients which have very high needs, can stay in the hospital for long periods of time and are very vulnerable to adverse health, uh, adverse events, which are all things that uh, organizations are very in tune, uh, in tune to. So I think focusing on those things is that we want to improve care and reduce the, the number of adverse events that this patient population suffers is a good way to engage the leadership because leaderships in hospital want to focus on these, want to focus want to improve care and there's also some funding attached to that so there's multiple areas of which I think can be used to engage the leadership to to participate um, in this initiative and in, re in regards to the question of reallocation uh, of, um, of uh, resources if uh, certainly I mean, you have to dedicate resources to where the greatest need is and the people that are the most vulnerable and this is the group that is most vulnerable and I think focusing on that will help uh, guide that conversation. It's never easy but at least it's, it's a way forward. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. Uh, before we end today's call, we wanted to point you to a few resources including the link to the prospectus and the expression of commitment. And there were some questions around the funds and what the funds can be used for. That's very, uh, we think, clearly articulated in Appendix 1 within the expression of commitment. So first thing we would do is refer you to the resources that are available as part of this call, the prospectus, the expression of commitment, the explanation of the resources and how they can be used. If you have any questions, you can get back in touch with us after having taken a look at that. You can also find resources on the Mount Sinai East strategy and the contact information for Jackie St. Pierre, the manager of, manager of partnerships and the main point of contact for TVM. At this point, I'd really like to thank our speakers for their excellent presentations today, and we hope for you, all of you online, this session has been helpful in explaining the nature of CFHI's ACE Collaborative and determining if participating in the Collaborative is right for you. Before you go off, we would ask you to please take a moment to fill out our quick polling survey, which you'll see right now on the screen. This really helps provide some useful information about where you see yourself in relation to the next steps uh, provided about um, applying to the Collaborative, including if you would like further information about this from CFHI. It would be very helpful to us. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session and to our three speakers and to your participation in today's discussion. Thanks so much. This concludes today's
today's informational webinar, and we look forward to your applications. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the conference call for today. You may now disconnect your line and have a great day.